Okay. So, um, welcome everybody to this uh, new panel debate entitled uh, How to Combat Disinformation and Fake News, Media Freedom in Central Europe. My name is Federico Terreni. I'm Policy and Advocacy Manager at the European Movement International, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, pan-European network of organizations um, active in, in 34 countries and encompassing the voice of over around 40 uh, international associations. Uh, bringing the voice of uh, NGOs, civil society, the academia, think tank, um, political parties, and, and business. Um, I'll have the pleasure to moderate this, uh, this very timely and interesting event, which is part of this uh, final conference organized by the Union of European Federalists called uh, uh, Democracies Europe, Remember to Revive. Um, today's uh, debate is about, uh, as I said, uh, disinformation and fake news, and the, the ambition is to uh, address uh, uh, media freedom in Central Europe. So there's a very specific uh, geographical uh, context, and uh, uh, to do so, I have the pleasure to be joined by four dist distinguished speakers who um, are, have a very strong expertise in these issues, and uh, I very much look, look forward to listening to their views. Uh, first, we have uh, Paul Butcher. He's a policy analyst uh, at the European Policy Center. He's, um, it's an independent uh, think tank based in Brussels, uh, fostering European integration um, through analysis and debate. Uh, welcome, Paul. Hello, Federico. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Uh, next, we have uh, Ziga Factor. He's the uh, head of the Brussels office of Europeum, an independent think tank focusing on uh, European integration and cohesive act co cohesion, active in the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, welcome, Ziga. I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And also, sorry, Federico, for uh, leaving you sitting there alone. Uh, because I was in Brussels just yesterday, but needed to come to Prague for a few days. So sorry for that. No problem. The situation is uh, rather worrisome. So we are well aware of what's going on. Uh, next, we have uh, Natasha Sticinska. Uh, she's assistant professor at the Institute of European Studies at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. Um, she holds uh, a PhD in uh, political science. She's, um, her expertise uh, covers several issues, such as uh, party politics, nationalism, populism, and Euroscepticism in the Central and Eastern European region. Uh, welcome, Natasha. Uh, welcome, everybody, both online and, and offline in Brussels. I, I'm really sorry I can't be with you, but I'm happy to see that there is quite a lot of participants and uh, looking forward to our debate, of course. Thank you very much and welcome. It's our pleasure. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Wojciech uh, Sibilski. He's editor in chief, in chief at uh, Visegrad uh, uh, Insight. It's an analysis and opinion journal, uh, which was established in 2012 by the Respublika Foundation in Poland. His expertise includes uh, foreign policy and uh, political culture. Uh, welcome, Wojciech. Hi, hi. So good to see people gathered uh, in the room. Sorry to miss that out. Uh. No worries at all. Uh, welcome again. And uh, before starting, I would like to remind the participants, both online and, um, um, and on site, that after the initial discussion, we will have the chance to engage in a Q&A session. And uh, we will be very happy to uh, collect your questions or simply listen to, to your remarks and thoughts. Um, so without further ado, I think we can start. And uh, perhaps I would like to start with, with you, Wojciech. Um, you know, zooming in on the, um, um, with Central Europe and specifically uh, the Visegrad, Visegrad countries, uh, um, maybe to kick off the conversation, I would like to ask you about, uh, let's say, the state of play of the current situation with respect to media freedom and disinformation in this, in this region. And um, perhaps also focusing a bit also on the um, uh, Visegrad, Visegrad countries. Thank you. Sure. Um, the situation is not uniform. 
Uh, there are similar trends in Central Europe, but uh, both the results of uh, the, the Media Freedom Index uh, indicate that countries of Central Europe are at various level of, um, of, of media freedom, uh, of, of the performance of media. And what I would also call, and uh, here referring to the narratives of Viktor Orban or Jaroslav Kaczynski, of the different levels of information sovereignty. And what I mean by that is um, the concept of uh, having societies uh, information control, controlled by being informed and well aware of the political processes that they are uh, to control by elections, by uh, public opinion pressure, because essentially, this is why media are uh, in, this, in the democratic setup the, uh, the so, so important, the fourth pillar, even if you say, of the, of the power structure. And the countries of uh, Central Eastern Europe overall, although different, they all experience a negative trend, uh, which is a global negative trend. However, uh, much going much faster in Central Eastern Europe than elsewhere in declining of the media freedom and therefore uh, what I would say also information sovereignty. Um, we've been publishing on that topic uh, for quite some time. So if you want to check that up, uh, there is a section on information sovereignty, including the very recent report, um, uh, showing also uh, interesting trends related to how many journalists in the countries that we're examining are employed as journalists, how many of them work in media uh, being fully employed, and how many of them are, uh, how many of them are um, freelancers? And, and here is another mixed picture, which I also wanted to indicate before I go any further, like a big picture is that uh, while you have um, people um, uh, seeing media capture at the same time, this is a prime time globally and also in Central Europe for journalism as such. Journalism that uh, seeks to explain processes, uh, seeks to uh, inform the public debate and, uh, and report on the events uh, that, to my mind, are also historic events in the, in the scale of, of Europe, European democracies, and also individual countries. So that's, uh, well, big brackets. And now, more specifically, um, we know, of course, and that's a repetition rather of what you already uh, know, that in Hungary we have a rap we have had rapidly declining um, media freedom as of 2010. That has been also observed in country, my country, Poland, uh, also catching up in a way in this negative trend of backsliding of media freedom uh, in Poland. And there are numerous reports that testify and explain that in more detail. And, but essentially, it is an Orban playbook, which is a, a Putin's playbook of how you uh, deal with uh, media when you do not want to fulfill the criteria of uh, a dem democratic uh, institutional buildup. So um, first, this is a takeover of the public media. Um, public media uh, paid by taxpayers' money and from the, you know, uh, serving public interest, which are hijacked for partisan interests and party uh, starts to control the agenda of the media. Then there is a, a takeover of a local journalism uh, that is not being lamented so much by the big media as they're often in competition. And uh, the regional journalism is the key element in consolidating the messages um, of political propaganda for uh, the local constituency, allowing uh, the party to uh, be more effective with the um, electoral propaganda, especially, including also uh, not only shaping the minds of, of, the, of the readers or uh, viewers, but also um, allowing for better understanding of the electorate as uh, you can see which topics are sensitive, especially uh, you can collect uh, data, uh, the data of the readers, seeing what drives the interest. It's a big social experiment uh, that we have seen also throughout Brexit campaigns or uh, in the United States, also with, with the toolbox of Cambridge Analytica. You can imagine this is same happening with Orban's toolbox or Polish uh, toolbox when an um, oil company, state-owned oil, oil company 
takes over regional newspapers. It does so partly to do propaganda, but also partly to access millions of users' data um, and to understand their interest in the topics, what drives them and what stimulates their um, uh, emotional response, which later translates into political electoral strategies. Next, uh, there are uh, intimidations and limitations on individual journalists, uh, which I think they are most likely and most usually backfiring. Also, this recent report that I mentioned on our site clearly indicates that the numbers of journalists is not falling, it's actually increasing. People who live off journalism, who declare their income based on that is uh, visibly uh, by uh, European services, um, labor uh, statistics, uh, clearly visible and observable is on the rise, but um, uh, the journalism as institutional journalism is being picked apart. Uh, there are um, actions which by now are called strategic litigation against public participation, which are targeting uh, not only the in, in journalists, but also civil society actors, but specifically in case of journals, uh, in case of media, they are to undermine the economic performance of, uh, and also time, they are time consuming and energy consuming um, that are essentially aimed at gogging um, the media that are not possible to take over and they're critical. And then if we play uh, fast forward the playbook of, um, of Mr. Orban and Hungary, this is uh, finally taking over of those who gave up or who give up and succumb to such pressures those who are declined the access to advertising markets, that they, they are declined the, the share or fair share um, uh, of, of income because um, government in, uh, introduces some specific advertising taxation policies that are targeting specifically again independence, um, or they, they don't have simply access a equal playing field um, in, in daily operations to access to information uh, from government uh, operations. So the information, freedom of information um, acts are being derailed. This is a playbook of Mr. Orban. As I said, Poland is closely uh, following, but this is not unique to these two countries. And in various forms, these are strategies that you can observe all across Europe and the United States um, and globally that have also a root in something which is a digital age scene, a primary scene of the digital age that um, we have observed throughout the 90s. Uh, and that relates very also closely to the strategies the media have had so far, which were based on advertising. Advertising markets um, uh, were always uh, fraudulent in a way because uh, advertising money is driving the editorial policy uh, throughout the media. And it also is also um, easy, relatively easy to undercut. And the basic model of media here will be my um, last remark. Uh, is the model of the media where you have a direct relationship and you do it in the public interest with the relationship to the public that you are addressing. With the digital age, uh, media have been, of course, in the crisis globally again. And uh, specifically, you could have observed that in, um, uh, in Central Europe, um, uh, the advertising models uh, pushed media to open up their contents for free access. So today, you know, I don't need to explain or give examples how much free access you have to different types of information that is uh, unparalleled to the situation before the digital age really erupted. In, um, in this uh, strategy and follow up of this strategy, the media have been losing up relationship to the, uh, to the readers, to the subscribers, uh, these uh, con constituencies even uh, of some sort, not political necessarily, um, but those who are committed and, and driven by um, supporting uh, their own independence, as I call it, uh, information sovereignty in a democratic setup, of, uh, so that societies and communities are willing to commit themselves by paying small fees even uh, to, giving, uh, to getting credible uh, information. This relationship has been lost throughout also and has, been, uh, has had tremendous uh, effect throughout the 2008 financial crisis, when the markets has been hit, advertising markets um, has uh, have, have uh, uh, made it uh, made it obvious for many of the media publishers, it's not a way to continue. You have seen a, a wave of bankruptcies and also difficult situation across Central Eastern uh, European media space, and several of the media across this space here 
in the face of different mergers, takeovers, have also started to build up um, uh, their response strategies. I will, my, I will close this, uh, my opening, with a remark that uh, the negative trends, also observable in Slovakia, are uh, countered by positive examples. And the positive examples of uh, the successful media that are building up resilience or building back the uh, type of relationship uh, that is essential for the media market, in my opinion, are quite successful also from Central Eastern Europe. You see Denik N leading, um, uh, leading uh, daily that is globally renowned for their uh, innovative and very successful uh, subscription strategy, becoming from zero to one of the two or third uh, most uh, reliable, most visited source of information where you need to pay for that information in Slovakia amongst the, the other top uh, contenders. And actually all of the Slovak media market is now uh, paywalled. And then you have Gazeta Vyborcha that started for free with free content and have developed, um, uh, it's one of the top 10 in the world with 200, uh, 250,000 subscribers paying for the content in order to be uh, to, to trust the content and to trust the readership, uh, to trust the information they're receiving. So I stop here and I can develop some of these points if necessary later on. Thank you very much. Well, you've depicted a very broad and interesting uh, picture of the situation. You've touched upon interesting issues that I'd like to elaborate more, absolutely, such as the role of technology, foreign interference, uh, uh, advertising, which is also very, very interesting. And uh, perhaps, Natasha, if I can get to you now, um, you know, building on some of the things that Voce uh, has said, uh, it would be very interesting to now listen to the, um, let's say, political scientist perspective, more of an academic uh, perspective and uh, see in the region, uh, what are the, um, let's say, the main threats? Because the challenges have been mentioned already, I would say, but shall we maybe try to see uh, which threats these countries uh, uh, are, have been facing and will face in the future when it's about uh, uh, disinformation and upholding uh, media freedom in Central Europe. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you, Wojciech, for, for, for me, extremely interesting uh, start of this discussion because um, uh, it's completely different to, to hear a practitioner perspective. Uh, an insider view, uh, and and that's that's very um, I think good start for for us. And there is a lot of things I I would also like to to follow up on um, challenges. And uh, well, I would like to. To, to start maybe from from a couple of numbers that that Wojciech mentioned, and I think it's it's very interesting to to keep it in mind when we when we think about the region. That first of all, it's not completely coherent. Yeah, we like to do this, draw these lines: Eastern Europe, Western Europe. We like to use, uh, especially we based in Eastern Europe, like to speak about Central Europe. Yeah, uh, to make ourselves a bit. Uh, detached from uh, from Eastern Europe and a bit closer to to the Western one. Uh, so first of all, it's a it's a very diverse region. So there are some trends, obviously, that are are um, similar. Uh, but uh, I would say the extent to which these things are happening uh, in Eastern Europe, not only regarding media freedom, but generally all political developments are in a way similar, but with a very specific country characteristics. And um, I, I always have a problem to, in five minutes, uh, close it in a nutshell and say, you know, what's the difference between Bulgaria and Poland and Hungary and Baltic states. Uh, but, uh, but I will try my best. So first of all, I would like to put this media, media freedom in a wider context of democracy of um, democratic governance. And this may be completely uh, obvious, but, but when we see a, a decline in media freedom, this is usually connected also with decline of democracy. So it's also connected with uh, a kind of changes or, or maybe sometimes unfinished democratic 
process. And this is the, the case, in my opinion, of this so-called new member states or, or new, new Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, call it as you want, yeah? Uh, but the countries that are on, in, in our focus for today. So, so the, the press freedom is shrinking while the authoritarian or illiberal practices are, are growing, yeah? They are on the rise. And this is what we observe generally in the world. Uh, as, as Wojciech mentioned, uh, this, this uh, trend is, is a general trend. It's not only uh, European or not only Eastern European trend. It's around 10% of decline in media freedom generally in the last decade. So I would say it's, 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 it's quite um, um, a big change. You may say 10% is not much, but then we, you know, we don't see it uh, being stopped somehow. So it means uh, it's rather a continuous uh, trend. So that's one thing. And the second is that um, obviously uh, this post challenges to, to democracy and security both internally, so within these countries, but also externally. So both for their bilateral relations, but also for a, for a more uh, broader perspective. So for European perspective, but also for a global perspective. And, and this is something that uh, I think it's, it, it's good to, to point uh, out here. And, and obviously a context. So we speak now online, half of, of us being here online at our homes or offices and half of, of, of the group being there in Brussels. And, and let's not forget that, that, that we are facing and measuring and researching and observing a very interesting phenomena uh, of a limitation of press freedom in this context of pandemic. And um, this um, pandemic that we actually don't know how we'll end, but, but this process that we are observing for, for last uh, almost two years uh, also brought a very interesting development to, uh, uh, to the media. Uh, and uh, I think, I hope there will be still um, a bit of room to, to speak about that, but this decline in media freedom is even visible now much more than before. If we look at the, for example, a pre press uh, freedom index, and you see this decline in Eastern Europe in the media freedom, you will see that it's it's a big change. It's a rapid change in the in the last couple couple of years. And and uh, in in this respect, I think only Slovenia improved in the ranking. Uh, otherwise, all of the countries, uh, former mm, communist bloc countries, they they declined uh, in this ranking. So we have like some big changes uh, when it comes to, of course, Poland, Hungary. I mean, Bulgaria that we very often somehow skip. I think it's here the the most uh, significant uh, example of, of the media uh, freedom being under under uh, threat. So um, so this um, pandemic. Mm, situation, if I may call it like that, that brought uh, new opportunities for these illiberal governments, for, for authoritarian uh, uh, governments to, to suppress freedom of, um, of media. Uh, and I think this is uh, one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest, biggest threats uh, that we are observing now, again, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but generally in, in, uh, in the world. And um, we, we have observed uh, several points, several moments, several uh, uh, issues already that were generating such a, such a distortion. And it was obviously Brexit uh, with the spread of the misinformation. We, we had a migration crisis that also was a ab absolutely fantastic um also case study and now we have we have covid pandemic so um my point here would be that um we, we are facing this the security and democracy challenge or problem if you i don't like the word problem that's why i prefer to say challenge um uh, and on on both internal and external level um uh, why it's a problem or why it's a challenge is also due to the fact that um uh, if you look at the EU policies uh, towards um, you know, freedom of speech, uh, then we are kind of caught in a trap. And this was also visible uh, when um, uh, EU was drafting this, uh, this legislation on fighting uh, uh, fake news. Because on one hand, you know, we want to secure media, uh, media freedom, but on the other hand, we also don't want to um, uh, suppress the, the freedom of opinion. And then, you know, who is uh, the one to decide? Mm. 
we seem to have lost you. Can anybody else online hear us to see if it's a problem coming from us or? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so it seems that Natasha froze. Um, anyway, we will get back to her. Interestingly, she's mentioned the very interesting points that I wanted to raise anyway, such as the, the impact of the pandemic on uh, information and the quality of information, uh, foreign interference uh, once again, and um, and uh, numbers. Uh, numbers are in this sense very important, especially for a political scientist. <laughs> um, I, I always invite uh, people to take a look at the World Press uh, Freedom Index that is always uh, every year compiled by this uh, watchdog group called Reporters Without uh, Borders. And uh, building on that, uh, Paul, I would like to get to you now to, um, you know, we've been zooming in on this uh, on this uh, specific region or these two regions in Central Eastern uh, Europe, but uh, let's try to zoom out now and take a look at what the European Union has been doing. And um, perhaps uh, um, with a lot of curiosity, I, I, I'd like to ask you if uh, you think the European Union has put in place the a solid and valuable toolkit to fight disinformation and uphold media freedom because we've we've heard from both speakers so far that uh, there's a, a general negative trend when it's about media freedom and uh, protection of uh, media rights. Uh, what is your take in that? Thanks, Federico. Um, very interesting question. I'm really looking forward to getting into the discussion. I see Natasha has uh, just joined us again. I just wanted to double check to see if she wanted to quickly round off her uh, intervention before I begin. No, no I'm I, sorry, it was kicked out. It's uh, We have a bit of snow and it might be <laughs> the case. Um, I think it's it's fine if you continue and then I hope we will still be able to, to discuss more uh, later on. Absolutely. So apologize for disappearing rapidly. No problem, no problem, of course. <laughs> we will get back to you, of course. Uh, as I said, you, you may have missed this point. Uh, uh, you've touched upon very interesting issues that I wanted to raise anyway, which is, uh, of course, the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic on information, quality of information, and then consequently the role of governments in uh, handling uh, or uh, using the pandemic in a very instrumental way to take control, if I, if I can say so, of uh, information, but uh, we'll we get back to that. Uh, Paul, now the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, so yes, I, I'll take a little bit of a, an EU-wide or, or Brussels perspective, but I will try to refer to Central and Eastern Europe a little bit um, where I can or where I feel competent to do so. Um, and I think I'm going to talk a little bit about um, disinformation as such, rather than media freedom in general. They're very connected topics, of course. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about how the disinformation problem is conceptualized at the European level um, and how it's tackled from a policy perspective. Uh, so you asked me if I feel like we have the right measures in place. Um, and I think, broadly speaking, the European Union's approach to disinformation as a uh, as a, a policy challenge is quite a good one. Um, now, it's a huge um, issue to tackle, of course, and uh, the solutions are by no means simple. Um, it will require uh, contribution by all parts of society to really um, overcome the, the challenges that disinformation faces and to build a, a more reliable and a, a more open information space. Um, but from a policy perspective, I think a lot of the EU measures are quite good, and part of that is precisely because of what Natasha was mentioning, that there is this, um, uh, this desire to preserve freedom of speech, not infringe on uh, freedom of expression rules, while also trying to promote a, a, a better information environment. Um, now, the ways that the uh, European Commission and the other European institutions have been doing that so far um, is mostly through um, a rather, um, almost rather loose self-regulatory measures. So, for example, there is the code of practice for social media companies, um, which is basically a, a code of conduct that has been drafted between the, in cooperation between the European Commission and representatives of big tech companies such as Facebook, Google and Twitter, 
uh, and advertising agencies and um, other uh, companies that are involved in this online information space uh, as it is developing today, where a lot of the information and disinformation is being circulated on uh, social media channels without uh, a kind of editorial role that uh, the media, uh, more traditional media um, plays. Um, and the code of practice seeks to set out a few guidelines for how social media companies can um, uh, do more to police content on their platform, um, remove bots and other manipulative techniques and this kind of thing. Um, now, I think that this is a relatively good approach because it does uh, indicate where the responsibility lies and set out some guidelines for what sort of approaches they should take, but so far it has been rather insufficient. A big part of that is because it is self-regulatory, because it is voluntary. Um, and I'm very pleased to see that the, um, the European institutions now are moving towards something which is a little bit more, um, more rigorous and will eventually result in um, some actual regulation. Uh, so the code of practice is currently being revised. Uh, we can expect that further down the line, um, it will be translated into um, firm regulation where the uh, requirements on social media companies are uh, actually enforced. Um, and this is also being implemented in, in parallel with the Digital Services Act, which has uh, a lot of um, aspects in it that relate to the role of social media companies in the, uh, the marketplace, uh, not just the information marketplace, but all kinds of other digital services. Um, so it's moving very slowly, but I think it is moving in the right direction. Um, not only in terms of relations with social media companies, but also with relation to uh, media and civil society as a whole. Um, the European institutions recognize that civil society has a very important role to play in fighting disinformation. Um, and the, they have started to basically provide a, a platform and uh, more resources for, for civil society actors to get involved in this fight. So notably the European Digital Media Observatory, or EDMO, E-D-M-O. Uh, this is a new um, hub which has been set up uh, over the last year or so, um, which will give uh, universities and uh, news organizations and fact checkers and other civil society organizations um, a kind of centralized um, hub for them to cooperate and to uh, work together in better understanding the disinformation landscape uh, and working to uh, counteract the influence of disinformation. Um, they have uh, national hubs as well, and there is a central European hub, which is in the process of being set up at the moment, as far as I'm aware. Um, now, all of these measures are rather limited by nature. We kind of we can't rely on just governments or the European institutions um, implementing policy uh, approaches to solve the, the problem of disinformation. Uh, we really need all of the different aspects of society to get involved, and that's why I think it's very um, uh, very positive that the whole media and civil society scene is really being implemented, really being brought into the uh, European institutions' uh, way of tackling uh, the problem. Uh, and I, I do feel much better about the way that the EU is approaching things than certain member state governments. Um, uh, I'm not only talking about uh, member state governments in Central Europe, but perhaps especially there, um, because I think that if we were to identify a few um, aspects about the scene in Central Europe that make it distinct from other parts of the continent, one of the main things that we would have to talk about is the role of governments, um, because there have been many cases of um, governments not only spreading um, information themselves, which in, at times kind of crosses the line into uh, manipulative content or potentially even disinformation, but also taking uh, quite harsh measures to crack down against fake news with the side effect that it also impacts um, independence, journalism and uh, media freedom as a whole. That's not unique to Central Europe, but I think the, the situation is particularly bad in some of those countries. I'm sure the other panelists will be able to say more than I can about that. Um, one last point about EU measures. Um, one legislative initiative or one uh, EU initiative that is very significant for this discussion uh, at the moment is the European Democracy Action Plan, 
which was unveiled at the end of last year and is in the process of being implemented and elaborated on at the moment. Um, I wanted to raise that particularly because it includes a lot of measures for boosting media freedom uh, and media pluralism, um, including um, measures to reduce um, legal uh, measures and intimidation of journalists, um, boosting their uh, independence and the sustainability of independent media and uh, that kind of thing, and combating disinformation is one part of the, the measures that the Democracy Action Plan puts forward. Uh, but I think the importance of this um, action plan is symbolically, it, rec it shows that the European Commission recognizes that media freedom is a very important part of democracy. And all of these things need to go together. Everything from uh, the rules governing uh, political parties to um, the role of media and uh, what role social media companies can play. All of this is sort of linked in together as part of strengthening European democracy. Um, and I, I think that, that that recognition that these things all go together is a very promising sign. But it's early days still. Um, the measures in the action plan will take some time to be implemented and then even longer for their, before their effects are felt. And I think that really, when it comes to counteracting disinformation, we need to take a, a, a rather long-term approach because we are really only going to see um, a significant improvement in uh, in terms of the information environment and the degree and the influence of manipulative content over a longer time perspective um, tied in with the development of uh, media literacy for European citizens. Um, this is also something that the Democracy Action Plan tries to implement, but it's one area which I think needs to be uh, stepped up and improved a little bit. Um, is the European citizens themselves need to be given the, the technical skills and uh, the awareness to know how to read the media at a time when the media is changing very quickly. Um, and that includes things like recognizing the reliability of sources, um, but also recognizing how arguments are constructed and um, understanding the uh, explicit and implicit biases behind uh, media content. This is all rather complicated and changes very quickly. There are some very good initiatives being implemented to try and improve media literacy, particularly in schools for younger people. But of course, we shouldn't forget that uh, um, older people who are no longer uh, in education or aren't um, picking up new skills, uh, digital skills quite so quickly, are a particular target group um, for disinformation. Um, now, I, I will just wrap up by saying that in general, I think uh, one of the, the questions that uh, Federico raised was uh, in the email circulated before this meeting was whether we have hope for uh, the future of the disinformation landscape. And it's very easy to be very pessimistic about um, all kinds of ways in which uh, political polarization seems to be increasing and our societies are becoming more and more fractured and um, it's difficult to know what to believe sometimes. But overall, I do have a certain amount of hope. And actually, part of it comes from the experience of the pandemic over the last couple of years. Um, because COVID did have a bit of an impact on the uh, information and disinformation scenes, at least at first, because it did play a role in raising faith in experts for a little while. If you remember the beginning of the uh, pandemic and the, the first quarantines, uh, it felt that. Um, factual accurate material was in very high demand uh, and was uh, there was a sort of renewed faith in the role of uh, medical professionals experts and this kind of thing unfortunately i think that's been di uh, diluted a little bit uh, by political arguments since and some of the culture war style conflict particularly over vaccines and conspiracy theories about the origins of the virus and and the role of elites and this kind of thing um, so I fear that the more the pandemic drags on, the worse this uh, division is going to get. But those initial moments of the pandemic do give me hope. I think long term, we will look back on COVID as a turning point with our relationship between politics and the information supply. Um, and I think once we are out of this uh, current uh, dark time, and I hope that uh, we will be out of it before too long, even if it feels like it's dragging on longer and longer, um, I think we may find that the relationship between politics and science and uh, factual, um, uh, verifiable information 
has changed for the better as a result of this. But that's not to um, and that's not to be blind to some of the political challenges that we are currently facing regarding, I think, especially distrust in um, mainstream elites and um, vaccines as an example of something which is gaining a lot of um, attention by disinformation actors at the moment. I think a lot of this is basically reflecting the fact that whatever is in the news cycle will be grabbed upon as the current vehicle for exploiting political divisions. At the moment it's vaccines, in the future maybe something else. Um, but Indeed. I'm hopeful that this will be the uh, beginning of a turning point. So I'll stop there and uh, looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, it's easy to be pessimistic, but it's also good to hear that uh, <laughs> the European institutions have been uh, working hard on that. There's a lot of uh, uh, promising stuff upcoming. You, you've mentioned the European Democracy Action Plan. Uh, I was also thinking about the rule of law mechanism. That's also strictly related to media freedom, but it's a higher topic <laughs> on the agenda, much more debated. Um, and also, I, I can only echo what you said with, when you've mentioned uh, uh, the role of civil society organizations in uh, upholding media freedom and uh, um, having a strong contribution in the fight uh, against uh, fake news and uh, uh, trying to provide good quality information, because uh, this is, at the end of the day, the, what, what matters the most. Um, building on that, uh, Zika, um, uh, I was I was thinking about uh, mm, asking uh, perhaps about your 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 experience your role you working for a think tank it would be we, we've listened to uh, different perspectives uh, very very interesting but perhaps it would be very interesting to know more about uh, uh, the role that uh, non-profit organizations such as a think tank can play in tackling disinformation of course, and um, so uh, by extension in uh, ensuring quality information. And um, building on this question, uh, I have a second question for you, Zika. Um, do you think, uh, um, without being too pessimistic, of course, uh, there's a, um, how can I call it, like a press freedom state of the emergency in, in Europe and more specifically in Central Europe? Thank you. Thank you, Federico. And uh, I would maybe uh, start with uh, your second question, uh, which was already like greatly introduced to us by Wojciech. So I believe that uh, after my intervention, uh, Wojciech would have what much more to say about uh, a possible state of emergency of the media freedom in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, there certainly are problems related to press freedom across the region, bigger problems that we could experience in, in the other parts of the EU. Uh, and most prominently, of course, this uh, links directly to Hungary, which again, which uh, already uh, presented uh, Orban's tool case. I mean, uh, the playbook that he uses uh, to basically restrict uh, media freedom in its own country. And uh, we need to also raise uh, this problem of uh, Orban actually uh, using this not only in his home soil, but also outside of his borders. And we can directly see it now in Slovenia, which is a very interesting case. Natasha was actually mentioning that Slovenia was the only country that has its index raised, but uh, I need to uh, say that uh, given the current government of Janusz Jansza, we might see a huge drop in the in the upcoming evaluation, because really the the playbook uh, that uh, Viktor Orban is using in Hungary is basically repeated in Slovenia on a on a very aggressive note, and uh, that is one of the biggest issues I would say currently that actually this liberal democracy way of thinking that is, uh, of course, presented by Hungary uh, spreads around uh, the neighboring countries. And uh, this, of course, uh, hurts me personally also because I was born in Slovenia and still see this uh, as a country that is very much pro-European, but with the current government, we, we see the issue. And uh, you probably heard about the situation with the Slovenian press agency basically being cut off 
of uh, national financing. There's a lot of pressure on the national uh, TV broadcaster, which obviously, yeah, again, it's a repeated uh, act, not only seen in Slovenia, but also in the other countries of the region. Uh, and here, definitely the most crucial is the support coming from the EU institutions. And this will be the most effective way to actually challenge these uh, illiberal, illiberal tendencies when it comes to uh, media freedom. Uh, both the European Commission and also representatives of the European Parliament, let's say when we speak about the Slovenian case, uh, were extremely helpful and extremely active in this case. Uh, and this is, I guess, uh, the way that uh, we should uh, you know, support uh, media across the EU and globally also uh, uh, against these authoritarian uh, tendencies. So yes, uh, if, if I might say uh, there is definitely an alarming situation in some of the countries uh, when I speak about Czech Republic as a, as a country where I lived uh, for basically almost 30 years and still working for a Czech think tank here the situation is a bit different and it is more of a problem of an ownership of the media is only in hands of few and with this few we talk about usually millionaires that are not only in czech republic but across the region basically buying media outlets so uh, this is maybe also a challenge uh, for the future on how to actually avoid having one person owning uh, media outlets across the region. And we're not talking about small media outlets. It's one of the, the biggest usually. So in Czech Republic, uh, for example, we have uh, this problem that we have actually Prime Minister Babish, the outgoing Prime Minister, uh, that basically has uh, around one third of uh, media outlets under his control. And we have another two, three people that kind of, uh, you know, uh, keep the rest. Uh, so it is very difficult then to speak uh, about uh, state of media as non-problematic when there in fact is uh, these issues arising. So I would stop here, but I believe that uh, the other panelists uh, definitely have also uh, something to add uh, upon uh, that. And uh, when we go back to, to disinformation as such and the role of civil society, think tanks, uh, but also journalists, I believe that the current pandemic really showed us the urgency of involving civil society in communicating uh, the situation, fighting disinformation and fake news. Uh, because if I take it from some broader understanding. Obviously, uh, when we speak about Central and Eastern Europe, uh, it is a combination of various factors, but we can clearly see that the countries of CE region are a bit less resilient uh, when it comes to disinformation. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of facts involved. Uh, we have, everyone thinks of uh, Russia as one of the big issues, and we didn't mention Russia so far in this conversation, uh, Russia is in the region's proximity and obviously uh, it still feels like uh, this is a sphere of their influence. Uh, so this, uh, this is information supported by Russian servers it is one of the biggest challenges for the whole region. But of course, as the saying goes, uh, you need two to tango and uh, there we really need to address uh, very slow and painful, painful progress when it comes to the side of the national governments of the CE countries. Uh, I would focus just a little bit about for, uh, the Czech example, uh, because here exactly the civil society think tanks were almost the only ones, of course, uh, together with the journalists, reporting about uh, the disinformation that was spreading around the COVID pandemic, especially about the vaccination, while the government was very chaotic and this basically caused even bigger harm to the whole situation. Uh, lack of political will, systematic work, uh, most importantly, really this terribly weak strategy uh, and crisis communication that we experienced here in Czech Republic 
not only supported the disinformation narratives, but it really gives, gave the space to external uh, influence of Russia in, in this sense. And it wasn't in Czech Republic only, of course, we also the, all saw the situation in Russia where suddenly out of nowhere, Prime Minister Matovic announced that he's buying uh, hundreds of thousands of Sputnik V vaccine without even consulting it with his own ministers, coalition partners, etc. And that is the big issue uh, that we have in the region, of course, throughout Europe, but especially in the region, that the politicians cannot communicate well the issue, and especially they even open the doors to have bigger problems in the region when it comes to disinformation. Uh, so uh, that is a problem. And really to mention like some interesting statistics then, uh, which was actually collected by a uh, Czech agency STEM, uh, around 40% of people in the Czech Republic believe some kind of conspiracy theory connected to the pandemic. And almost 30% think that actually the government together with the health sector are actually creating artificial race of numbers of you know, COVID uh, hospitalization. And that's just due to some financial aspects. And, and this is really a problematic uh, thing. And it is mostly connected to how the, the politicians are talking about the situation. So uh, bigger involvement of the civil sector, uh, better communication between the state sector and think tanks, for example, uh, would be great uh, added value to fight this information uh, because also we need to always keep in mind the capacity and expertise problem coming from the you know on the side of the of the national governments because although there would be a lot of will and even enough of finances to actually tackle as much as they can uh, the hybrid threats uh, they still lack expertise. And this is an area where actually we think Think Sphere can, can help a lot uh, on the national level, but of course also on the EU level. Uh, so I believe uh, the bigger inclusion of the civil society is much needed to uh, get out of not only the disinformation around the COVID-19 pandemic, but generally looking forward into the future. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much. Um... You've, you've mentioned conspiracy theories, uh, which is something uh, very, very interesting and uh, that uh, uh, we've seen widespread all over Europe and not only. Uh, there, there are very good examples around the US elections, for instance, or the US campaign. And uh, mm, Natasha, uh, perhaps um, uh, I, I'd like to get back to you to see um, whether these conspiracy theories uh, uh, are uh, are used uh, and to which extent are used by governments and uh, to spread this information uh, to ensure a bad quality information and uh, and to see also to which extent uh, all these measures uh, are um, let's say pushing for more uh, liberal governments because I've I've read I've, I've heard by I think most of you that uh, um, there's a problem also when it's about uh, liberal or, Ill or illiberal democracy. Uh, and uh, it will be very interesting to know more about that because uh, eventually when we talk about uh, media freedom, we're talking about one of the uh, most important fundamental rights uh, that uh, uh, build on, on a democracy. Yeah, okay, thank you. I hope it will be good now with my connection. So, um, yeah, it's connected, definitely. And uh, um, the simple question would be yes, definitely. They are used, they are, they are absolutely uh, one of the best tools you can have uh, if you want to um, consolidate uh, citizens around some possible or or imagined threats yeah and uh, of course they are a um, very handy tool in the hands of the illiberal government so conspiracy theories are nothing new and yeah? that's that's nothing that uh, that popped up out of the blue in the time of pandemics we observe them um, for a very long time for for many decades uh, all around the world uh, and they they are very popular, they are a very useful tool, 
uh, in the hands of, of the politicians, and they are also hand, very um, handy tool in the in the hands of um, big corporations of, of different groups of interests. Uh, but why? Mainly because they are offering very simple solutions, very simple answers, explanations uh, for uh, the situations that we are unable to understand or the situations that are complex. Uh, so they are popping up usually in times of crises. So they pop up during um, situations that are not uh, black and white, that are not easy uh, to explain to the citizens uh, and that may be double bottom, they may have some other dimension. And uh, obviously we see um, a kind of a new uh, revival, I would say, of these conspiracy theories that are uh, connected, obviously, as you said, with, with the fake news. They are very often kind of the same type of information. And we see uh, a rise of them uh, in the region again connected with the rise of illiberal practices and connected with some kind of crisis situation. So we saw them during um, migration crisis in 2015-16. We are seeing them now during the, the COVID uh, pandemics. Um, the question that very often um, I'm, I'm asked and but I'm also thinking about it myself when I'm analyzing the uh, the political activities of the of the re regional leaders are why actually Central and Eastern Europe is so prone to this type of, of conspiracy theories. And, and I think that this has um, to do a lot with uh, a lack of trust and, and the aftermath of this post, uh, I mean, the post-communist mentality, aftermath of the communist regime. Um, uh, but also um, the fact that actually democracy uh, is not uh, so well grounded in the region, is not yet, the system is not completely stable, is not completely institutionalized, uh, comparing to, to Western uh, democracies, to all democracies in Western Europe. So it is much easier in a way to put a seed and, and see the results than, uh, than in more established democracies. Although you can, you can say, well, what about Brexit? Yeah? What about uh, a financial crisis? What about migration crisis? So, uh, so definitely uh, Western democracies are, are, are not immune to this type of conspiracy theories. And we saw, uh, I think, one of the best examples in, uh, in the United States with the elections of, of Donald Trump, right? And later his presidency. Uh, but in, in the context of Central and Eastern Europe, this uh, conspiracy theory would, would utilize uh, all the fears uh, that are very characteristic for the region. And these fears are mainly a fear of, of being dominated by some foreign powers, some secret powers, you know, coming from outside that would always uh, try to influence the region, but, but you know, we were resisting and we managed, but now they are trying again. And, and this is of course uh, connected very much with, with anti-Semitism, with xenophobia, with, with generally um, a fear of, of, of something unknown coming from, from outside of our worldview, uh, but also with a feeling of distrust uh, in institutions, uh, both on the domestic level and on European level. Um, very interestingly here, uh, most of Eastern Europeans trust rather European institutions than domestic ones. So, so that's why it, it, it works uh, that well, but also a dis disappointment with um, current state of affairs. So disappointment with uh, transformation, this post-communist transformation, disappointment with globalization, Europeanization, uh, and so on. And, um, and maybe not to take uh, too much time, I would like to, uh, to bring an example of uh, um, so-called COVID diplomacy, uh, uh, vaccine diplomacy that, that we could observe in the Balkans, mainly in Serbia. And also it's connected with both with fake news and conspiracy theory and the media freedom, uh, because I mean, uh, media independence in, in, in Serbia is questionable. It's similar situation um, as in Hungary or in Poland, where um, theoretically we do have a um, a lot of independent outlets, but in practice, they are actually connected uh, to the regime and the regime is, is, is heavily uh, subsidizing them by, for example, buying advertisements. 
uh, so so they are connected to uh, to uh, tycoons to a uh, uh, business that is friendly to 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 the regime and then uh, this this issue of a vaccine uh, diplomacy is interesting because first uh, we we observe how uh, the government um, was using these conspiracy theories and fake news in order to 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 paint an image, to draw an image of uh, of um, great Serbian government that was able to work with everybody around the world to bring whatever possible vaccines to Serbia, right? Especially uh, from China, from Russia, but also from European Union, uh, and then. Um, Building this whole uh, narrative uh, of defenders of the of the nation uh, here, so that's that's one example. But of course, we do have much more of them uh, when it comes to a whole COVID pandemic and the way they are used by uh, by the ruling governments, uh, both in, in 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 Hungary and in Poland, but 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 also other other countries in the region. And and the way uh, the governments are um, tackling this issue uh, is uh, also very often by not spreading the fake news, right? Because they, they can't rather do that. But uh, what is interesting is uh, that they don't combat them very often. And that's something that you know we pay less attention to. Uh, but the question is uh, whether not being act active in combating conspiracy theories regarding health issues, for example, or not combating fake news, whether it's also whether we shouldn't consider it as an action. Yeah, because not doing something is actually uh, pushing for 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 some solutions uh, in not a direct way. Uh, so I think that uh, that these things are obviously obviously connected, and um, and maybe I will I will stop here and 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 pass the floor to to other panelists that maybe have some more practical experience regarding that. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Um, um... In, it, it's actually very, very interesting, and uh, I, I, will, I would really like to try to build on that and see more concrete examples. And uh, uh, before doing that, I just would like to ask the audience, both online or uh, uh, off, on site, if there are any questions. There is one. Uh, great. Can I? Thank you very much. I know that uh, lunch time is approaching, so let's try to get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Esther Nag from Hungary, and uh, I would like to uh, react uh, to Natasha's um, uh, statement that uh, uh, she said that uh, the governments don't uh, diffuse fake news. But yes, a Hungarian government uh, diffuses actively fake news uh, via the public media. Actually, there were public uh, advertisements that George Soros wants to bring in millions of migrants into Europe with a big red arrow pointing to Europe. So this is not true. So they, it's not only that they don't find fake news, but they are actively spreading it. And uh, there is also an additional um, media uh, tool. These are the big billboard campaigns. And the big, I, I think you must have heard of it because it's a new invention actually from the Hungarian government that they put all over the country the big billboards with fake news. So they are actively uh, fighting, uh, spreading the fake news uh, to the people without, you know, it's a push media. So uh, that's rather a comment. And just one more thing, uh, I wanted to add that uh, we talk a lot about the role of civil society. It was also mentioned by several uh, participants, but uh, for example, there is a media watchdog in Hungary, Mertek Media, and they filed two complaints to the commission about uh, one was um, state advertisements and uh, the other one was uh, state aid complaints to public service media and uh, it was to the competition dg so the competition uh, director general and there was no real answer and my question would be uh, there are new, always new tools, you know, democracy action plan, um, now the rule of law mechanism. But there is an existing toolbox. Why is it not used when it could be possible to use? Thank you. Thank you very much for first this very useful example and your, your second point. And uh, I very much agree with you um, <laughs> um, because indeed we, we have uh, the European Union has put in place a strong toolkit. It's already been implemented and agreed, but uh, 
uh, not fully operational. So this is a, this is part of a continuous debate, uh, mostly um, uh, pushed a lot by the European Parliament. Um, I hope you've heard the, the, the question, the point, who would like to uh, react to that? Uh, perhaps uh, I was thinking about either uh, Paul, since there's a European Union approach, or maybe uh, Wojciech. Uh, please, I don't I, know who to choose. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to say a, a few quick words first. Please. Um, on the EU's existing toolbox for um, counteracting this kind of problem, um, it's true that the EU does have certain measures already um, but I think many of them are, they face so many political or practical challenges that it's very difficult to actually get something moving. I mean, this goes for all aspects of European politics and the, to a certain extent, it's difficult to get agreement and it's difficult to get things off the ground and the, the wheels move very slowly. And in the meantime, um, certain other actors can move very quickly. Uh, and this is part of the architecture of the European system that kind of puts it at a disadvantage. Um, but particularly when it comes to um, taking action against um, member state governments that are infringing on European values or on or cracking down on media freedom or this kind of thing, um, there are so many veto players who can uh, basically prevent the EU from really making much of a, a difference. Um, and I think that the existing toolkit is um, kind of lacking in the 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 tools that would stop short of being uh, nuclear options. If you see what I mean. For example, the Article Seven procedure is often described as a nuclear option because it um, it seems like a, a very um, a very strong uh, method to take, but also one that the member states are a bit reluctant to implement because uh, they don't want to ever be in the position where it might be used against them. Um, that said, I can take the example of uh, the time when Article 7 has been used and the member states' voting rights have been suspended, uh, which was in Austria in 2000, in reaction to um, the uh, Freedom Party entering the government, so a, a far-right uh, party entering the government. Back then, that was considered enough of a, um, a big deal to implement the, the EU's strongest possible sanction against a member state. Um, and today, 20 years on, it seems that this sort of thing is, is not quite normal yet, but it's happening in quite a lot of member states. It has happened in quite a few member states recently. Um, and it no longer has the same kind of um, unanimous political reaction that it did back then. I think that reflects that we're in a rather different political situation now and that even mainstream politicians are a lot warier than they used to be about really standing up for European values. And that is a concern. Um, on uh, relating this conversation to disinformation a little bit more, I can also mention, since uh, we talked a little bit about Russia earlier, um, one of the challenges that the EU institutions and national governments face when trying to counteract disinformation is precisely that they don't want to infringe on media freedom laws or freedom of expression. Um, and this is a bit of a challenge when it comes to disinformation that is coming from internal sources or domestic sources. So uh, European populist actors, the radical right or, or whatever, people who are spreading disinformation from inside Europe rather than disinformation that's coming from outside, because that's also a huge part of the picture. Um, obviously, Russian campaigns, not only Russia, but uh, you can name other uh, foreign actors as well, are a big part of um, the uh, disinformation that is being circulated in Europe or the um, kind of um, ideas or uh, influences that they're trying to spread here. But a lot of it is spreading more widely because it is being picked up by actors inside Europe. Uh, and in some of the research that we've done in EPC, looking into uh, disinformation, um, we found relatively few sources that were really obviously linked to an external um, hostile state actor. Most of what we found was being spread by uh, specialist blogs, YouTube channels, um, fringe media outlets. They were all European-based, but were pushing uh, quite extreme 
um, perspectives and points of view against European values. And basically, the EU and most national governments are rather powerless to do much against that if it really means having to point the finger and call out something as disinformation, because it starts to become very complicated um, when it relates to media freedom laws. Um, and the European External Action Service is currently working on um, some uh, conceptualization ideas to basically make this clearer, because a lot of people sort of assume that the uh, External Action Service can take action against disinformation in general, and actually that's not really the case. It's very limited in only being able to um, take action against things that have a clear connection to Russia or to China or to other actors. And this is another reason why I think the role of civil society and media is extremely important, because they are the actors who can defend the European media Hello, space, please. no matter where the um, hostile content is coming from. Thank you very much. Very, very useful. Um, before going to the final Q&A session, just two follow-up questions. Um, one from Wojciech. Um, so, uh, in, in, uh, after all this debate, it would be very interesting to maybe go more concretely into the role of journalism. And uh, um, because, you know, during, during this pandemic, there have been many editorial choices by certain media outlets in which they have uh, generally favored uh, uh, quantity over quality, uh, a decision that had the strong repercussions on the quality of information and uh, to a bigger extent uh, to the dissemination of the fake news. Um, the question is, uh, um, how much do you think this pandemic has impacted on, on that, on uh, namely the, this spread of, of um, uh, disinformation and, uh, and uh, extensively then to perhaps uh, uh, the threats to media freedom? Tricky question. How much time? Well, lunch is one minute. approaching. One minute. So no, I think one minute, right? Because we need to. Uh, I understand the session ends in in fifteen minutes. At least I have it saved. So um, yeah, and we would like then to have a quick Q and A yeah. session. So I know it's tricky. <laughs> well, uh, I'll give you an example. I think the pandemic acceler accelerated certain. Um, certain trends and processes, both positive and negative. On the positive side, and I don't think you'll be surprised if you heard, if you were listening to my introductory remarks, the subscription rates uh, went off the roof. I mean, uh, went through the roof um, uh, for, for those who were prepared. And then who those who weren't prepared, they were quickly catching up because during the pandemic, uh, people were actually looking for reliable information. I mean, when, the, when it, uh, when information means, uh, the proper information means saving your life or not, people are willing to take the real, uh, you know, real choices about getting informed decision. Um, and I don't necessarily say that every information that you pay for uh, is reliable, but I mean that people want to demand and they realize they, they want to be uh, not only products of the information cycle and the media uh, ecosystem, as we know it from the advertising advertising market, where viewers, readers, viewers online or you know anywhere else, are equally recipients of the information in the public, but are, they're also the product of the um, they're being sold, right? I mean, their attention, uh, everybody's attention, is being sold to advertisers. Um, with the uh, not necessarily regulatory steps by the Commission uh, or the European Union, uh, I think uh, that situation is anyway quickly changing. Uh, it's quickly changing because of the pressure of the private companies that also start to observe that the digital, in, digital advertising uh, brings no accountability to uh, value for money. And you have seen already before the pandemic, PNG and Unilever scaling down by hundreds of millions of dollars uh, on online campaigning uh, and digital com uh, campaigning, as well as FBI and Google uh, combined efforts to track down um, essentially botnets uh, that were fraud, uh, that were extracting money by you know fraud ads uh, campaigning. So the digital environment uh, market uh, needs to be somehow regulated on one side, but it also is um, uh, and is under pressure from the very actors being seriously involved and paying for it. 
Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, subscriptions we uh, went um, up uh, during the pandemic. Another positive thing, just to, not to start with the negative in the first place, um, is um, what you have seen and observed in, uh, for instance, in Italy. Uh, when Russia and China landed their planes in the first months of the pandemic, supposedly with the fantastic uh, response to the very rapidly deteriorating and terrible situation that Italy has uh, experienced in the first months. Mm, um, it was um, quickly discovered by Italian press uh, that most of the staff that was landed uh, wearing medical uniforms and delivering some sort of packages were not really doctors, they were information intelligence officers. Uh, all of a, all of a sudden, uh, quickly going around, you know, looking for information, NATO bases, and so on. The information resilience, therefore, of of Italian market, I think, was quite well. But what I wrote at the same time was a lot of criticism towards uh, very notable and 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 very good experts on this information, because the global global fears of of that kind of exploitation of the situation by the usual geopolitical actors who would like to stage their um, you know, mass campaigns against uh, democratic uh, systems, also this way, exploiting also this peril, um, were feared and amplified by the specialists of disinformation themselves. And here is the third element of the final point, what I wanted to highlight, um, um, examples of people both in Poland and I linked in one of my pieces, I, I don't know, you can, you can search it online for Visegrad Insight, uh, pointed out to, for instance, Elizabeth Bra, otherwise formidable expert of disinformation, who wrote in foreign policy about how the West is losing information war, where in fact in Italy it was already winning, at least Italian has proven itself, uh, Italian media information space has proven itself uh, resilient or the information sovereignty has been defended. Um, uh, or the same was happening with Polish analysts, uh, Witold Jurasz uh, in Onet top, uh, uh, top media uh, in, in free media. Uh, so web portal that where, where advertising is the is the business model, where he also was warning against uh, and 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 scaring people out that you know Russia or China are winning this uh, information battle, and the conclusion for me here is that during the pandemic, what really matters is all this digital connectivity, but for journalists and journalism overall, what matters is direct access and secondary sources, which internet always is secondary is uh, not enough and transnational uh, debate and this transnational format of um, reporting where you have sources when you travel when you meet people and you get access is really under pressure during the pandemic and any effort to uh, cut through the barriers and walls and borders is so essential to keep up um, you know the, the the democratic resilience um, in in the west Thank you very much. And uh, if, if I may just to jump in with uh, two comments, please. I just wanted to uh, say two short things uh, after what uh, Wojciech was saying. And maybe uh, a thing that we didn't highlight it enough so far when speaking about disinformation and the role of uh, free media is that when it comes to the typical uh, mainstream media outlets, the traditional way of uh, how to get information, it is not those who spread uh, this information, uh, at least uh, in a very limited amount. Uh, more than 90% of all information comes from either social media or web uh, pages that are you know, written not by journalists, not by experts, but uh, people that themselves, uh, you know, uh, actually get information from uh, disinformation sources. So I think this is one, one thing to hi highlight that it is not predominantly about the journalists and the uh, traditional media, but it's, it is mostly about the social media and the web pages uh, that are not connected to journalist work. And uh, the second thing Wojciech was mentioning that uh, subscriptions to uh, media outlets uh, skyrocketed during the during the pandemic. That is true, uh, but uh, when we look at the statistics, also uh, a number of people, usually uh, from this circle of uh, 
of social groups that didn't really have an interest in following news. Also, this number of people that follow now these information channels skyrocketed. So this is also an issue. It is true that we have way more subscriptions to very quality, uh, high level quality journalism, but we also have way more people following uh, disinformation uh, sources and this polarization is a big issue. Indeed, thank you very much. Thank you both. And uh, interestingly, what uh, mentioned something that had to do with the um, region where I'm from in Italy. I remember very well what happened when the, in the, um, most dreadful moment during the pandemic in the early 2020, there were these uh, supposedly doctors that came and they turned out not to be doctors and not be of great help. So I do remember that. Um, so we are uh, coming close to an end uh, before uh, uh, the very much awaited lunch, I'm aware. Um, is there any question, any follow-up that uh, uh, both people on online and on site would like to ask? Uh, any further comments? Uh, yes, we have someone. Oh, thank you. Grazie. Yeah, thank you for uh, for this for this talk. It has been amazing. I just want to do like a quick question because I think Paul mentioned. And I think it's very interesting because it's, I guess, like a real alternative because this bottom up approach, since the government and the structures are not, I mean, not reacting, but even actually, as Esther mentioned, going against and promoting fake news. I was wondering if, uh, like, both from uh, academic, institutional, like, like just some quick comments on how those information or Central Europe or EU information hubs are more or less structured. And what are kind of like the role or the alternatives? If maybe they are like, who are the um, their components? Maybe social media, also citizens, traditional media like newspapers, um, online media, and also what is the intention or the ambition, the role to have like more consultative, more kind of like give it a common response, integrated communication response as a as a as I guess as a counteract to this bottom to, to this top bottom like fake news promotion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps uh, uh, Natasha, mm, a few words, if you want to react to this question. Oh, I, I see Wojtek raising his hand. I don't want to take the floor. Ah, I didn't see him. Uh, please, mm -hmm. you, you can go both. Uh, go Natasha, and if there is time, I can add something for me. Definitely, that's a question to you and Paul. <laughs> I'm ping ponging it back to you. <laughs> okay, so uh, so following up also on what Ziga said, the Central European that the, the, there was a research that we published also in 2016 a poll about, and there are now many polling about where people get their information from, where do they have in Central Europe, where do they get uh, their uh, opinion about you know the public affairs, about public uh, public debate. And in Central Eastern Europe, it is much more to a much larger degree, degree, for instance, is compared to Germany from social media. That of course results in uh, uh, different levels of conspiracy theories. And again, I, I would underline uh, because social media are not so much about creating a forum, an open forum where you have cross-cutting debate. They're about creating bubbles and because of that bubbles, when you don't travel, when you don't even look beyond your bubble, you feel like you're satisfied with your uh, hungry information monkey and you're feeding it uh, with the prejudices that you might have had already. So there is no surprise in the, uh, there are no, you know, truth is surprising, there is no surprise in social bubble, just think about that. And in Central Eastern Europe, the process is much more advanced. And why I say advanced, is that because uh, in all of the countries of uh, EU, we see this process happening. As again, Giga pointed out, this is um, going on in every country that the level of social media consumption in terms of seeking information and being, you know, having the alternative di digital version of mm, sources of information as the main source is rising in comparison to journalism as uh, understood as following the uh, the standards of fact checking before publishing and things like that so um, so central europe is 
more in the avant-garde of the negative trend that we discussed all over uh, across Europe, but it's not that other countries and parts of Europe are immune to that. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, maybe I stop here. Thank you. Um, Paul, would you like to react to that too? I'll say a quick word. Um, I think the question was about the hubs that I mentioned, right? So the European Digital Media Observatory hubs. Um, and I can say a, a word or two just to clarify what they look like and what they're trying to do. Um, because uh, it's maybe a little bit complicated and it's still kind of taking shape because they are just launching at the moment. Um, but basically the, um, the hubs are not national hubs, but uh, regional ones. So for example, there is one called the Central European um, Media Observatory, which I think has partners from all four of the Visegrad countries. Um, and most of the hubs are mostly more about understanding this information and how it spreads and research than they are about actively counteracting it themselves. So most of them involve mainly universities, um, independent researchers, think tanks, sometimes a few media companies and fact checkers, uh, but not necessarily people who are really engaging in the counter communication aspect of counteracting disinformation, which I think is a bit of a, um, uh, a, a missing aspect from the picture, because that's very important. Uh, we published a paper at EPC about uh, communication responses to disinformation, about migration in particular. Um, but it's also the case that all of the uh, digital media observatory hubs are very different from one another. Um, and they mostly reflect um, the, uh, the interests and the priorities of the member organizations. Um, so for example, I think the Central European one has a particular focus on researching the possibility of using artificial intelligence to help detect uh, disinformation on social media. Um, that's a relatively small part of the uh, overall picture, but that's a, a, a priority for the research organizations that are part of it. Um, so in some ways, I find the European level more promising because that really is about putting together a network of fact checkers across the, the whole of Europe. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Very good question. Um, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, uh, well, I just uh, would like to uh, thank very much the, the speakers for their uh, invaluable contribution. Uh, it was very, very interesting and insightful. Uh, it seems that uh, this is not the end of the conversation, clearly, that uh, there's a lot to do. And uh, we've talked about uh, challenges, uh, threats, and the positive aspects. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, more will come up. And we very much look forward to uh, seeing your work and further this conversation, of course. And um, I wish also to thank you all very much for your for your participation, for uh, for your for your interest, and uh, uh, voila. So I think it was uh, really really great. And uh, um, uh, to everybody, uh, stay safe. And uh, hopefully next time <laughs> this event uh, will not be held in a hybrid format. I will be surrounded by more people rather than only myself. I very much hope so. And uh, thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.